Just keep Christmas to the back for Junior Church. And the rest of you, I want to invite you to take out your Bibles and let's turn together to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, the text that we're looking at is verses 38 through 41. And we uh, are working our way verse by verse through the book of Luke on Sunday mornings. And uh, this is uh, a very encouraging text of scripture. And I hope that as we look at the contents of this passage and just think about this passage in light of the rest of scripture, I really hope that it'll be an encouragement to you this morning. Luke chapter 4, verse 38, here's what the text says. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. That's Simon Peter. Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever. They brought him for her. He stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sickness with diverse diseases brought them all unto him. He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Devils came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. He rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Let's be out together for a word of prayer and ask the Lord to really help us to understand the passage in front of us. And then let's dig into a very comforting text of Scripture. Father, I'm so grateful that we can gather together as a body I'm thankful for each, each person that is with us this morning. I, I know that each of us carry burdens on a daily basis. Some of them are health-related. Some of them are relational-related, financial-related. You know the various burdens of our hearts. I pray this morning as we open up this scripture and as we think about the fact that you related so kindly and so compassionately to these people that were in a very desperate situation, that you are the same compassionate God who works in our lives. As you demonstrated your authority and your power and your sovereignty, I pray that we would see that the same power that you possessed in these moments you possess today, and you apply them very specifically and very personally in our lives. Father, help me to communicate this text of Scripture in a way that's consistent with its intent. And I pray that you'd open our understanding, help the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts through the word and impress these truths upon us and help us to apply them very personally, very directly in our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. The passage before us is a very interesting passage. In fact, I'll give you the following summary statement so that we can kind of understand what is the main purpose as we move our way through the book of Luke. This section, this following portion of Luke 4, provides an encouraging reminder that Christ had compassion on people in their most desperate situations. This gives us insight into His goodness and His authority. So as we read these verses, what we're going to see is that there were people that were in tremendous desperation. Primarily, these are people who had health desperations. One of them was Peter's mother-in-law, and yes, Peter was married, and Peter had a mother-in-law, and Peter's mother-in-law was very sick, and when it says she had a great fever, we'd have to assume that this means she was probably in a situation where she could potentially die from the sickness that she had. It's interesting that later on in these verses, we read that as the sun is beginning to set, the day is over, most people would go home to their homes, and they would kind of rest and get ready for bed, and then they're going to hopefully get the rest that they need to go into the next day, people are coming in massive droves, many people who are sick, many people who are infirmed, and they're being brought by friends who have the power to bring them to Christ. And the reason that they're being brought to Christ is because these people see the desperate situations of their friends or family members, and they're going to plead with Jesus to do for their friends or their family members what he just did for Peter's mother-in-law. What we're going to see is that Jesus stopped. It's kind of like when you and I would be coming home for the day. Jesus' day was beginning. And it says that he healed all of the people that were brought to him. It tells us a lot about how good Christ is. It tells us a lot about his power and his authority. When we're reading these verses, the primary reason that Luke would have recorded these details is to demonstrate the authority of Christ. It's to demonstrate that his person is, in fact, God in flesh. Jesus has authority over sickness. Jesus has the power to forgive sin. 
He's demonstrating this authority in these verses. He's also demonstrating the humanity of Christ. His compassion, His care. We see that these are very personal verses. So as we read through this passage and as we dig into some very specific details, let's not lose sight of the primary intent for which Luke would have recorded these words to help this man, Theophilus, to go, I can believe in the Christ because I see evidence, proof of who he is. What I think the Lord would want us to see from the scriptures this morning is that when we find ourselves in desperate places, we can rest in this very simple truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is in charge and he is compassionate. And I want you to see that from this text and many others this morning. You know, well, you may ask, well, where do we see that this morning? Well, let's go ahead and begin with this first truth that we find in verse 38. I'm going to read these verses and then we're going to look at truth number one. Desperate situations are a painful part of our fallen world. Here's what it says in verse 38. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. It's kind of an interesting way of putting it. She didn't come to Jesus and say, can you heal me? I would have to assume that the reason they had to come to Jesus for her is because she couldn't come for herself. She was in a very desperate place. Later on in these verses, it says, all they that had sickness and diverse diseases, they brought them unto him. Again, we're seeing people that don't have the power to go to Christ themselves. Somebody has to actually bring them to Christ, and we see that these people are in desperate places. This concept of being in desperation, it's it's something that every single one of us has, will, and in the future is eventually going to find ourselves in places like this. And there were two specific factors that were leading to the desperate situations that these people had. Some of their desperate situations were rooted into physical infirmities. We could say that they were sick, they had illnesses, they had things that were debilitating, they were not able to function in a healthy manner because of physical infirmities. Every single one of us gets sick. No matter how many precautions you and I can take, we're never going to be able to somehow navigate through life without sickness. There are some sicknesses that the reality is we're going to get them because of the genetic makeup that we have. This is something that we inherited from our parents, and if we have children, we've passed it down to them as well. And we're going to come to a certain situation in life, a season of life, where some of these physical issues are eventually going to start showing themselves in our lives. You say, well, why is that? Why do we have sickness? Why do we go through physical infirmities? Why do we have these debilitating situations that unfold in this world? The simple answer is it's because it's a fallen world. We're going to dig into this a little bit more in just a few moments, but a lot of our desperate moments are really connected to things that we have absolutely no power to control. We could eat the perfect diet, we could exercise regularly, we could do everything right, and there's still going to be a day that something takes us out of this world. It's inevitable, it's going to happen. These people we're in a desperate situation because of physical weakness. But there was a second category here as well that's also very interesting. During this time that Christ is on his earthly ministry, we see several situations where there are people that didn't just have physical challenges, but they had spiritual challenges as well. The way that it describes it is that there were people who had devils. We could say that these are people who had either demonic oppression or demonic possession. When we say possession, we're saying that literally a demon is controlling this person in such a way that they are in some very desperate situations. They can't even control themselves. We could also talk about demonic oppression, which while this demon is not controlling them in the same way, the influence that this individual demon has is debilitating to this person as well. So whether we're talking about physical infirmity, demonic oppression, or demonic uh, possession, the reality is that these people were in desperation. And I'm going to remind you of something that maybe I don't need to remind you of because we know it's true, but the reality is this. We live in a fallen world. And a fallen world is a painful world. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many rich blessings that we enjoy in a fallen world. 
We talked a lot about this in our Ecclesiastes study this past Wednesday. We need a balance in how we look at life. Yes, it's true it's a fallen world. There's pain and there's suffering and there's sickness, but there's also rich, beautiful blessings that we enjoy in this world. I think about yesterday uh, in the morning I was doing a walk, and this is like the very best time of the year to do walks in this area because all the flowers are coming out. And so I'm walking down the road, and as I'm walking, I'm like, all these people have cut their grass and it looks immaculate. And all the roses, they're just exploding in color. And I can smell the roses as I'm walking down the road. And I see all these birds and I see all this activity. And there are all kinds of incredible flowers that are in full bloom right now. I don't know about you, but that's amazing, is it not? It's beautiful. It's a fallen world, yes, but there's a lot to enjoy in this fallen world as well. And so we kind of have to keep this balance of perspective. There are things to enjoy, but there are things that are very hard and they're very harsh. One of the things that's wonderful about the scriptures and a Christian worldview is that the Bible gives us the tools to have the balance. And the Bible gives us hope because the reality is that Christ is going to give us an eternity that's free from sin and sickness and death and all those things. And so we have the ability through scripture to have the balance of perspective. But I want us to think about this for just a moment. This is a fallen world. It's a painful world. Romans chapter 8, verse number 20, here's what it says. It says, the creature was made subject unto vanity. And I, I highlighted that when I was working through this. Not willingly. He then goes on to say this, it shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. The very best you get in this world is corrupt on some level into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Later on, he says, even we ourselves, believers, groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Let me just mention again the way he describes the brokenness of a fallen world. It's subject to vanity. It's in bondage to corruption. The creation groans in travail and in pain. And we groan within ourselves, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. That's the world we live in. And so when these people are sick and they're coming to Jesus because their friends are bringing them to Jesus, it's a reminder that this is the kind of world we live in. It's a world that's subject to vanity. Think about Ecclesiastes 1 where it says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor that he taketh up under the sun? You know, life is very redundant. You ever feel like you're kind of getting in a rut in life? I I'm sure we've all kind of been there at different times. We feel this. Why is that? Because there is an emptiness to this world. If it's not for God and it's not for eternity, it's not for the gospel, it's not for redemption, this is a monotonous, drearysome world. There is brokenness because of the curse of sin. Just think about how the curse of sin affects us on a personal level. We are sinful creatures. That means that our minds are affected by our sinful nature. Our affections are broken. Our wills are set in opposition to God's authority. This morning in Romans chapter 7, as Bruce was teaching, he, he read a very interesting statement, and it basically says that sin took occasion through the law. And you go, well, hold on a second. So the law is righteous, and it says, don't do this. And when it says, don't do this, sin took occasion in my heart? What, what? I thought my heart would say, oh, I don't want to do that. It actually is the exact opposite. It's like you have a bunch of junior high boys walking down a hall. And as they're walking down the hall, one of the maintenance men who keeps the facility had to paint a little area, and he puts wet paint, don't touch, on the door frame. Do you think those junior high boys will walk past that without just kind of sticking their finger? No, of course they won't. Why is that? Well, because when we're told not to do something, now we're aware of what we want, right? That's human nature. You say, well, why is that? It's because we're broken creatures. If it wasn't for the gospel, if it wasn't for regeneration and having a new nature that God gives us when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, if it wasn't for the gospel, 
our minds would continue in blindness, our affections would continue to be broken, our wills would be continuing to be set in opposition to God. But as new creatures in Christ, we go through this process of sanctification, and God is changing our mind to shape it into the thinking of Christ. And he's, he's developing within us affections that reflect the character of our Savior. And he begins to press our wills in a direction that honors Christ and his kingdom, not our flesh and this world system. And then we even think about spiritual opposition. First Peter chapter 5. He says to be sober and vigilant because our adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It's pretty negative, is it not? These factors all work together to press us into desperate, painful situations. It may be that this morning you're in one of those seasons of life. It may be that you've been in a season of like the, life this, like this for a while, or you're not in that moment, but you're afraid it's like lurking in the shadows behind you. You know what I mean? It's like you go through a really tough time, and then things kind of get a little better, and you're like, I'm just waiting for the hammer to fall. You know what I mean? That's how you feel. God does not insulate us from every trial of our faith. And that's a reality that we see illustrated in this text There's a second truth, though, and this is the incredible comfort. Actually, it's the beginning of unbelievable comfort. In verses 38 through 40, notice what it says. It says, he, that's Jesus, arose out of the synagogue, and he entered into Simon's house. Now, if you know that somebody is sick unto death, and they have a fever, would you might want to just, like, have dinner outside the house, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, let's just kind of keep our distance. We don't want to get what she has. He didn't do that. He went into the house. The people came to him, and they pleaded with him, could you please help her? Could you please heal her? And this is what it says. It says, he stood over her, and he rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she arose and ministered unto them. So Jesus heals this woman. He demonstrated his compassion He demonstrated his authority, his power. We then continue on, it says, immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sickness with diverse diseases brought them unto him. Now it doesn't explain to us why there is like this time frame from when she was healed to ministering to him. Now it's evening and all these people are coming. So we have to, in our mind, just kind of ask the question, well, why is that? Well, what I would kind of envision in my own mind, maybe I'm wrong at this, but that when Jesus heals this woman, everybody knows what's going on. You know, it's like when we have major health issues, well, we have a prayer list. Why do we have a prayer list? Well, so we can pray for people, so we can be informed of what's going on in people's lives. So this woman was known to have this problem. And if she was close to death, people were preparing even grieving for this moment and when she's healed and she's serving in the house word gets out really fast all of a sudden people are going jesus just healed this woman hey you have an uncle who's got a situation just as bad as hers hey your aunt's going to hey you have a child that's infirm my mother's in this situation my grandfather's in this situation all of a sudden people are going to their homes and they're bringing these people to christ because they're saying if you can heal her, you can heal my family member too. That's what's going on. But by the time they get to Jesus, it's time for bed. It's evening. It says that the sun was setting. When we took the teens to camp last summer, we had some interesting issues with the van, so it was a little bit of a longer day. And I remember when we got to the town, I guess I'll call it a town, it was a very small community up in New Hampshire where the camp is, we needed to get fuel for our van. And so I remember we drive in and I I park the van and I get out and this young lady comes walking out of the gas station and says, sorry sir, we're closed. I was like, you're closed? She said, yes. So what time did you close? She's like, five minutes ago. And I'm like, could you please not help us out? Five minutes? She said, no, I'm sorry, we're closed. A lot of people have that mentality. If it closes at 9, don't come at 8.55 through the drive-thru because you will not be served. You know what I mean? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus saw all these people coming, 
I'm sure an exhausting day, physically, emotionally, and he healed all these people. That's what he did. And there's two things that I think are amazing takeaways from this. The first is that Christ is full of compassion. In James 5.11, it says, you have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful. Now, when we, when it, that word pitiful in this context, it's an old English term. It doesn't mean, you know, pitiful the way that we think of it. It means he's compassionate. It means he's kind. It means his heart is full of pity for those who are in tough places. That's what mercy is. He says he's very pitiful. He is of tender mercy. How do you view God? I I don't know, if we were to do a survey and we were to kind of see how people view God, not how are we supposed to view God, but how do we view him in our circumstances, I think a lot of us would have to admit, say, well, I kind of think of God as somebody who's kind of waiting to pounce on me when I get out of line. Something bad happens in your life, and the first thing you do is, I I wonder if I've been tithing regularly enough, or I wonder if I've been been treating these people the right way. Is there somebody I forgot to say I forgive you to, or there's something I didn't make right? Like, immediately, we kind of go to that that way of thinking. I'm I'm sure nobody here ever does that, but that's how I do sometimes think, right? But is that the way that God is? I mean, if that's really how God, God is, well, we wouldn't be here. We'd all be, you know, in the hospital or something like that because the reality is it's God's grace is how he deals with us over and over and over again. He is kind to us. I want you to notice how many times in the Gospels we see God's compassion being laid out in how he's relating to people. Listen to Matthew 9, verse 36. It says, when he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. When Jesus saw this multitude of people coming to him, and if you're not familiar with the situation, it actually was connected to the story of Jesus talking to the woman at the well. And so when all these people are coming out of that city because she's saying, come and meet a man that's told me everything I've ever done, they're coming out and they want to talk to Jesus, and the reason is because They're people with problems like this woman, and they wanted Jesus to address that. And he's moved with compassion. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. He was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sicknesses. Mark 1, 41, it says Jesus was moved with compassion, and he put forth his hand, and he touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. By the way, the person he touched was a leper. I don't know if anybody gets a little squeamish around blood and all that kind of stuff, all right? I mean, it's like when there's a, a real nasty diaper that you got to change, and, I, and, I, and I'm like dry heaving the whole time, and I'm like trying to change this diaper, and any dads out here? You know, okay, I see one over here, right? You can identify with this, all right? We don't like to touch nasty things. Here's this guy who is a leper, and Jesus touched him to heal him. Compassion. The one that I think to me is the most impactful is John chapter 11. Listen to what it says in verse 32. This is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. He says, when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, listen to what it says. He groaned in his spirit, and was troubled. Now, did Jesus not know what he was going to (laughs) do? I mean, he came to heal, not heal, he came to raise Lazarus back to life. In fact, when the disciples came to him, they said, why did you linger? He says, well, Lazarus is sick for the glory of God. In other words, his death is going to be something that demonstrates my authority. I'm going to use this to prove and demonstrate who I am. That's what he's saying. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. So then why is he groaning? You think he was trembling with excitement because he's going to raise this man to life and he's going to demonstrate his power and his authority and his goodness. And all the people are going to go, this is the Messiah. That's not what he was doing. He was troubled because he saw how it affected them emotionally. That's your Savior. He groaned in his spirit, was troubled, and said, 
where have they laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And then it says, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused even this man that he should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning and himself coming to the grave. What do these verses tell us? Jesus is compassionate. I don't know how you view your Savior and the circumstances you find yourself in, but if you don't see him as the scriptures are laying him out in this text, you're, you're believing a lie about the Savior. There's a second thing that I want you to notice, and that's he had authority to overrule this situation. And there is a sense in which this is a temporary overruling. When Jesus healed somebody, he healed them in that moment. They were restored in health, but it's not like they lived forever after that moment. I mean, poor Lazarus had to die twice, okay? So he got sick and he died. He's he's, he's raised back to life, and at some point down the road, he dies again, okay? So whenever someone was healed in these circumstances, it is a temporary demonstration Jesus has the authority to heal, but you're still going to die and you're still going to have to go through glorification and enter into God's kingdom with a totally different kind of body, a, a glorified body. That's something we have to understand. But whenever Jesus temporarily healed somebody, and I say temporarily, I don't mean he was healed and five minutes later he wasn't. I mean, in that moment he was healed and his health was genuinely restored, but there will be a day this person eventually dies. Every single moment that happened, it was giving people a glimpse into the authority of Christ. He has the ability, the power. And by the way, it's a foretaste of what's coming. There is going to be a day that there is a healing forever. That's what glorification is. We get this momentary glimpse. Listen to what it says in Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5. We read this already this morning. He says, bless the, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. I'm just going to make a real simple statement. You get sick, you go to the hospital, you're not a Christian, and, you're, and you come out. Guess what? God did that. You say, well, that person's not a Christian. They didn't even pray. Well, that doesn't mean that God wasn't working in that situation for their good. You pray, and you're a doubter. <laughs> you're not sure if God's even going to step in in this situation, and he does. Guess what? He heals. When we go through affliction and sorrow and physical weakness and sickness, and we come through it, it's because God did that. No doctor has the power to heal. Doctors care, God heals. There's a difference. And so he emphasizes this. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. Psalm 46, I read this uh, at the senior luncheon this past Thursday. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A refuge is somewhere where you're protected, Strength is something you need, that you need when you're not, <laughs> okay? And he is a present help in trouble. His presence is there in the midst of trouble. So what these verses show us is sometimes God, he just protects us from something, and we don't have to pass through it because we're, he, he's our refuge. And sometimes he goes, actually, this one, you're going to have to go through it, but I'm going to strengthen you in it. That means, though I'm not keeping you from it, you're going to get through it. That's what it means. And a very present help in trouble means he's there with us in the midst of what we're going through. That's emphasizing how good God is. That's emphasizing his authority, his power, his sovereignty. Secondly, he's going to eternally heal. Each momentary glimpse into his authority is meant to reinforce that conviction that one day there's going to be a wonderful glorious restoration of this creation. Revelation 21.4, God is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes that there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain 
for the former things are passed away. Anytime you and I experience God's marvelous healing hand in this life, it's a taste of the real healing we'll experience down the road. That's really what it is. It's a reminder that he's going to do that once and for all. And so those things are to comfort us. He is good. He is compassionate. He is sovereign. Truth number three, we can rest in his compassionate care in our desperate situations. What I want you to do is I want you to turn to another psalm that I think really lays this out very well, and that's Psalm 91. Psalm 91, I'm not going to read the entire psalm. I'm only going to read the first two verses of the psalm, but I'm going to kind of refer to a couple of the contents that we find in Psalm 91. Here's what it says. This is how Psalm 91 opens. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, unto the, of, the, say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Now Luke 4 gives us this vivid reminder that Christ is compassionate in the way that He cares for people who are hurting. The Scripture is full of examples of these kinds of reminders. I mean, when we read through the Gospels, we see it over and over and over again. Even when we read in the Old Testament, we see example after example after example of this. We even see a lot of this teaching in the epistles. But when we think about this Psalm 91, Psalm 91 gives us a lot of different scenario situations that we find ourselves overburdened in. I want you to notice them. But before we read it, I want to remind you, what he says later on in Psalm 103, the the text we mentioned earlier. It says, like a father, verse 13, pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He knoweth our frame, he remembereth we are dust. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, his righteousness unto children's children. No matter the nature of the desperate situation you may find yourself in right now, or you were in, or you will eventually find yourself in, We can rest in God's compassionate care. Let me give you some scenarios. Is it not a terrifying thing to have an enemy who hates you and is watching you and is plotting to destroy you? I don't know if you've ever had a scenario like that, but there are times in life we find ourselves. David knew what that was like. I remember when we were missionaries overseas and we were robbed quite a few times actually. And we weren't careless about situations, but the truth is that there are people that they watched others for opportunity. And I remember the very first time this happened, someone came into our house while we were sleeping, stole everything electronic of value on the side of the house that we were not sleeping in. And I just remember when that happened, getting this sense like, somebody has been watching me for quite a while. They know when I get up. They know when I go to bed. They know which windows are left open. They know where I sleep in my house. They know what electronics that I have. It's a scary thing to consider. There are people, sadly, that have such evil intent. And that's terrifying. So, I hope I didn't just put this in your head. <laughs> but the question is, can you be comforted in those kinds of situations? David says yes. Yes. He says in verse number three, he says, surely he, that's God, shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. A snare that a fowler set up is he's a hunter and he's trying to catch something, okay? And I don't know if anybody's ever set up a trap to catch something. I've done this with a groundhog or two or three or four or whatever, okay? But I know where that thing goes and I know what he likes to eat And so I put the trap right there where I know he's going to come through and he's going to see this. You know what I'm talking about, all right? I guess I was the fowler in that moment. (laughs) And I put out a snare. In other words, there was a deliberate thinking through of how to catch that animal. And in a situation where you have an enemy like that, God says, uh, David says, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. In other words, rest under the shadow of his almighty wings. Another example, the terrors that's associated with an uncontrollable health infirmity. Now, he says it this way, he shall deliver thee from the noisome pestilence. 
I don't know if any of you have done a little bit of reading about history, but when people talk about pandemics in the ancient world, we're talking about pandemics that like, like literally wiped out 50 to 75% of an entire city or community. We talk about bubonic plague. We're talking about nearly 250 million people, I believe is what they say, died. The United States has a 350, 370, something like that. I guess we don't really know how many people are in the United States right now. But it's in the 350 million-ish, okay, what's the point? The point is that that's almost 70% of our population dying. This is the kind of stuff he's talking about. Not something where, you know, the chances are pretty good, you know, Maybe one in 20 people are going to get sick enough to die. We're talking about, you get this? One in five. How about one in three? How about one in three of you are not going to make it? That's what he's talking about. Actually, it'll be two in three of you would not make it. What's the point? The point is this. If you were to find yourself in such a situation, that would be terrifying. Yet you can rest in the sovereignty of God in such a situation. The terror of uncontrollable circumstances. Verse number four, it says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. This is a, a picture of a mother hen who's got all these little chicks running around, and she pulls those chicks up under herself, and she protects them. They are vulnerable And they don't have the sense to even realize how vulnerable they are. And she just pulls them up under her wings and she protects them. And the fact is that when their circumstances you and I can't control at all, God protects us in such a way. This is a really interesting one. The terrors of the thoughts that undermine the peace that we have in our hearts. You know, your situation may not be that bad from a circumstantial scenario. You may have everything in a good place on paper, but internally, it isn't so. You understand what I'm saying? It's like a person who has a good position in life, but internally, they are plagued with all kinds of internal turmoil and trouble. In verse number four, he makes a very interesting statement. He says, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. He's not talking about, in that verse, someone who is in danger of dying from a pandemic or someone who's in danger of being killed by an enemy or someone who cannot defend themselves from some circumstances completely outside of their control. He's talking about God protecting them from what's going on in their own head. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm saying? His truth is going to confront the lies that are in the heart, and it's through that that the person is going to find a rested soul. In other words, not all the things that terrorize people are things that can actually hurt them. Sometimes it's what they think can, but actually is no danger to them at all. It's what's going on inside their own heart. And so he says, God's sovereign even in those situations. And then he mentions the final, the terror of the unknown when life is out of control. He says, a thousand shall fall at thy side, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. We don't know what it's like to live through what these people would have lived through. But if you lived in Jerusalem, and let's just say that you look at Jerusalem's history, or I know we had some people that traveled to Europe recently, how many different kings ruled in some of these these uh, castles, like every 15 years, is like somebody came in and plundered the capital and then they established it as theirs. And then, you know, 15 years later, somebody else came in and did the same thing. A terrifying thing. So people live through what it was like to have an invader come in and just like, just decide who they're going to take and who they're going to let live. And what does he say? He says, God is even in control in defending his people in the midst of those circumstances. What's the point? No matter your desperate situation, you can rest in the compassionate care of God. Now, you may not feel that way, but you can. And I'm here to encourage you that you can. I want to conclude with this final thought. God is in charge and we can trust him in all circumstances. Do you believe that? 
I don't know the trials or the afflictions that are weighing heavily on your heart. I don't know how you're processing the difficult circumstances that may be running through your mind. I don't know. But I have a sure word from the scriptures this morning. This is not like, I'm just going to encourage you, I know it's going to get better. I don't know that. I'm not God, I'm not a prophet. I don't have that kind of information. But here's what I do know. God is compassionate towards us in our desperation. I, I can tell you that. No matter what you're finding yourself in, he genuinely cares. He has a heart of compassion towards you. The scriptures just lay it out. And number two, the God who has compassion towards you in your circumstances is in charge. Does that make sense? He's compassionate, and he's the one who's in charge. Now, you may have some people that are intervening in the process that believe that they're in charge, but they're answerable to him ultimately. He's in charge. And so God calls all of us this morning to do what Philippians 4, 6 says. Let me read it to you. He says, be careful for nothing. That means don't be full of care. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, that's important. Whatever is true and honest and just and pure and lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. The scripture is not saying, decide what you can and can't think about based on this. He's saying, think about this. <laughs> think about what's true. If your mind is full of things that are all hypotheticals, then obeying this truth is thinking on what you know to be true. Whatever is just and lovely, of good report, virtue and praise, think on these things. God can and desires to comfort us in our circumstances. And I pray that this will be an encouragement to you this morning. Let's bow for prayer, please. Father, I'm so thankful that when we read these verses, we see the character of our Savior. Christ is compassionate. He rules and reigns. And I pray that you would help us in the midst of whatever circumstance we find ourselves in this morning, that we would fix our minds on what is true. You are good, you are kind, and you're in charge. And I pray that our minds would be settled as we think on these things. Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, I pray that you would open their heart to the gospel. I know that wasn't the focus of this message, but the reality is the greatest demonstration of your love for people is the cross. And so I pray that you would help us this morning to reflect deeply and consistently with great discipline on what is true. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen.